Flood, what's up, man? Just having technical difficulties, that's all. <laughs> what's up, man? Hey, this is uh, this is my buddy from Ball State, uh, Bradley Brookhart. And uh, Bradley, I met Flood when I was at um, Wisconsin Lacrosse. So okay. Uh, anyway, it just so happened that excellent Flood was able to hop in at the same time as you today, and like we just hang out and chat for a little bit. And we'll Sounds just re- good. Record everything. Nice to meet you, happens. Coach. Hey, you too. And Bradley was out at uh, well, you're at William and Mary, or I can't, re- I can't remember. Okay. Yeah, I was at William and Mary for six years. Did you just get tired of the college grind? It was strange. It was uh, probably within a few days of my daughter being born, my com- my mindset just completely changed. Yep. And uh, I stayed on. My daughter was born in July, and uh, she was born about two and a half months early. Oh, wow. Yeah. She's doing great. No, no issues or anything, but... You know, I slowly, luckily she was born over the summer. We weren't super busy over the summer. We had football and, and basketball and that's about it. But uh, once we started back up, my whole thought process changed, you know, what I wanted to do and instead of working 60 hours a week, yada, yada. And then we did have some changes. We got a new athletic director and then, you know, some other things started to change, which I wasn't like upset about or anything, but it was just another reason to be like, you know what, let's look into something else. Let's right. see if there's another way to uh, kind of make this work. So, um, yeah, it's been, uh, it's been great though. <laughs> cool, man. How long have you been running your own business? Um, it'll be two years in February. Okay. Nice. Two years in February. Uh, still growing it. Still want to try to get a lot more clients. I want to say a lot. Well, yeah, I want to get a lot. But uh, well, I want to grow it, but obviously be able to, you know, spend time with my daughter as much as I can. My wife, when she's home, she's she's an ICU nurse, so she's working quite a bit these days. But, uh, man, life is pretty good, though. Good, man. And what, uh, what kind of clients do you have? It ranges from, uh, I mean, some of my friends to, uh, you know, f- you know, 40 and 50-year-olds and a couple of high school kids. Uh, trying to do sports, you know, baseball, football. So it's a little bit of everybody, which is great because it challenges me, especially being in the college setting for so long. I used to work with athletes, but especially the older clientele where they have a lot more, their injury history may even be, you know, longer than, you know, a freshman or sophomore coming out of high school, even though they may have had two torn ACLs, a shoulder injury. You know, it's, right. it, it's quite challenging to work with people, general population, if you will. And people who, yeah, it's just, they just have different needs. Their histories are so much different than college kids. Yeah. So, uh, so flood recently got back, back into strength and conditioning at Cameron, right? So, um, yeah. How, how old's your kiddo now? Uh, just turned eight weeks Saturday. Nice. All right. Wow. So has that affected your thought process at all? Has anything changed for you or do you still? Uh, so he was born August 8th. The semester started on the 17th and we actually weren't going to start training until the 31st. So we kind of said, hey, bring the kids back, but like, we don't know what they're going to come back with. So like, let's hold off for 14 days and figure that out. Uh, we'll move on from there. I remember the first week, actually, Travis, I think I texted you and I said, I don't want to go back to work. I really love being a strength coach, but like when you hold your own child in your arms, you're like, work doesn't really matter. You know? <laughs> and it's crazy because only a few years before that, I had told my wife, like, listen, I think I want to be a dad, but like my athletes are my kids, you know, like, I don't know when I'll be ready. And then all of a sudden it's like changes real quick. Yep. Yeah, man. So, Bradley, are you working with are you working with people in person at all, or is it strictly online? Everything for me right now is online. Nice. Um, which you know proposes a lot of its own challenges. Yeah. You know yeah. that one, the biggest one being communication. Mm-hmm. And uh, I mean, I'm not sitting there. I'm not. I'm not able to correct them. You know, coach them on their uh, form, and if they're doing it right, you know, it's just trying to get 
you know, we can do zoom and things like that, which is awesome. But I try to have them even send me videos of themselves doing exercises when possible, just so I can be able to see them move Mm -hmm. because it's hard to evaluate somebody if you're not there with them. Yeah. You know, evaluating them and communicating with them, having them understand providing me with as much detail as possible is what's going to make our relationship work. Yeah. If they're not going to break down like every single thing, you know, how, you know, is the warm up going? Is it easy? Is it hard? Are you tired of it? Is it boring to, you know, the first exercise, break down each set for me. Is it easy? Is it hard? How much weight you doing? You know, the more, feedback I get, the more you can help them. But if they're not willing to work with you on that, it can be very challenging. Yeah. Yeah, man. I, there's a, uh, there's a small handful of people I work with online as well and it's strictly remote and, uh, you know, it really does come down to communication and they have to send me videos quite a bit. And then one thing that's, that's changed for me, I mean, these folks I've worked with for a while, so they understand movement patterns and that kind of thing. But um, the progressions are different when you're completely online, you know, Mm -hmm. um, because when they are strictly working with you remotely, you might have to, Hey, we're going to do a a goblet squat first. And I'm going to have to make sure that goblet squat looks okay before we can even talk about a front rack squat or back squat or whatever. So you find in anything like that. Absolutely. And especially when their equipment is limited. Uh, some of the people I work with, I mean, they don't go to a gym, so yeah. everything is at home. So they may not even, they may not have anything. So I may have to just be creative and try to find stuff around the house. You know, stairs for one is a big one, you know, just do you know some step ups or, you know, some box jumps, but jump up onto your steps. If you have a, you know, flat landing that you're able to do that on. Um, so f- finding progressions in that regard, when they don't have any weight mm-hmm. to progress to, yeah. it's very hard. So, so when I was in, well, when, when I was in, whenever I was in quarantine, uh, um, you know, we're doing body weight workouts and that was what I got sick of the most is I liked it at first, but at a certain point you're like, I can only do so much, you know, <laughs> with like household items and, mm-hmm. you know, a full laundry <laughs> basket, you know, like gallon jugs, you know, and at some point you're like, I need more weight to, to progress or whatever. Uh, so I applaud you for being as creative as you can and, and helping people continue to progress even while they don't have much, you know, it's hard to do. <laughs> Man, I said, uh, there are two. Yeah. There's one guy that I'm working with. I sent him a block of training or he's fortunately able to get into a gym right now. Uh, another lady I'm working with, she has like a little, little gym at her house. And, uh, Anyway, their, their block progression was uh, one and a half reps on all of their compound movements. So it was a nice progression because, you know, again, going back to if, if what you have is limited, you know, how can we make this harder and still get an adaptation? And uh, I got a lot of, a lot of cursing out <laughs> sent back <laughs> in, in our communication tool and whatnot. But overall, I, you know, it's, it's a matter of just being creative and, okay, how can we get a new stimulus without – adding anything else so one of the things i try to incorporate is lots of pause reps uh eccentric movement uh and just isometrics Mm -hmm. just to challenge them do something different maybe the same movement you maybe still be on a bodyweight squat but let's go down and pause at the bottom for three seconds before you come back up you know that set of 10 is going to be much more difficult than it was if you're just doing 10 bodyweight squats right uh so just trying to be you know change the tempo of the movements to adjust the difficulty level now flood how about you man i mean what's your what's your layout look like and how are you working around space limitations and equipment limitations and things like that so it's kind of been a progression of different thought process processes at first uh we were going to treat everybody as the uh, each team as a family. And so it was kind of like, they're going to be around each other in practice and in the locker room and whatever. So like, whatever, you know, it's as long as there's not multiple groups at the same time, there's not really any uh, capacity 
limits. The issue was then, so let's say there's 24 people in the weight room, then the strength coach is potentially you know exposed to 24 different people. There's not really a whole lot of room. There's not a lot of ventilation, stuff like that. So I ended up saying, hey, let's, let's try and do groups of like eight to 10. So we have eight racks in our weight room. Uh, it's not a very wide weight room though. And so like you can fit eight racks, but like then there's only maybe like 10 feet in front of your rack before the wall hits. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I said, hey, let's, let's try and have smaller groups. We'll try and train outside as much as possible. And we'll move our dumbbells outside and whatever we can. Uh, and then we'll, we'll go from there. That turned into, I don't know, probably three weeks ago. We had, we went from like three cases to 18 cases or something like that in a matter of a week and a half or something like that. And so we decided that everybody has to wear masks while they're training. But the the positive with that was we still stayed with that eight to 10, but now we were able to come inside a little bit more and use racks, uh, you know, just not have to lug your weight outside to lug it all the way back in. And if you picked the wrong dumbbells, like, sorry, you know, you got to struggle through it or like they're just too light, you know, whatever else. Uh, so now we're back to a pretty traditional training look with wearing masks, um, and just telling people like, Hey, if you need to take a little bit more rest time in between a set or something like that, that's, that's fine, but you got to keep your mask on. So the nice thing though is, yeah, uh, with dirt, with certain teams, it's been good. Um, other teams haven't been so great. It kind of depends on how their sport coach handles it at practice. And if their sport coach is on it, then they're fine. Um, obviously as like we talked i've got a little one um i've got one person on my strap my staff who has some um potential health issues like nothing there but like uh the immune system isn't great mm-hmm. and so I, I just said hey you know like they get one warning and the second warning you just kick them out for that strength session and we don't want to do that you know but that's how we're going to do it and i said you guys can can remind each other all you want so if you see somebody and you're saying, oh, hey, you know, like pull it up over your nose, like that's fine. Uh, but I don't want to have to remind you all the time. That's not my job. Not to police, you know, you wearing a mask correctly. Like my job is to train you. And if you can't listen to how I'm telling you to do that, then sorry, you know. Mm-hmm. So uh, for the most part, it's been pretty good, especially after we, we said that. Uh, we'll, we'll see how that goes. But th- again, the nice thing is that we can actually train better, I think, because we're inside. So, right. Gotcha. So, how's uh, Bradley? What about you, man? How's uh, everybody you're working with? Have you had any anybody had any issues, or everybody remain re- relatively healthy for the most part? Or how's that looking uh, for you? Everybody's been relatively healthy, at least that they've told me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, you know, a couple people have ventured back into the gym. Um, some people are still at home. Obviously, some of the kids I work with, they're remote learning. Yeah. So, you know, they're not having too much interaction. Um, but luckily, you know, things have been pretty good. Uh, I haven't had to worry about anything. And that's at least especially from online coaching. You know, yeah. I don't have a weight room. I have to disinfect after every group. And, uh, you know, yeah. I don't have to. <laughs> I'm sure that's a. Uh, I talked to a lot of, you know, former colleagues and stuff who are still in the college setting. They're just like, we have they've transitioned to having the athletes do it themselves because they're like otherwise we just three people to clean an entire weight room or one or two you know depending on how many coaches you got uh for you know 10 15 minutes in between every session that adds up that's a lot of time yeah so i I, you know they have a lot of athletes do it and luckily that's one thing i don't have i don't have like a gym or anything that i you know coach people at so um it's a lot less I have to worry about, you know, from an online coaching standpoint, but, you know, still just be mindful, you know, the people that do want to go back to the gym, you know, feel free and do so. That is your own choice. I'll design whatever program you want based upon your needs. Uh, just be smart. Mm-hmm. You know, just be smart about it. Yeah. You know, a lot of gyms are probably fine, you know, but uh, just be responsible. Yeah. Yeah, I think this whole thing has definitely made people uh, a lot more aware, a lot more cognizant of, you know, how gross we are as like a species, you know, like people just Hopefully people started to learn how to wash their hands <laughs> like, again. And they, well, dude, that you'll see people just sneeze. It's like, <laughs> cover your face, man. Like, <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> so I had a kid the other day walk into my office, first of all, and that bugged me. <laughs> so instead of like being at the, the door, like walked all the way in and then was at like my, you know, like where I, I have a bunch of different stuff. And he was like, hey, can I use these Kleenex? And I was like, so the way, the proper way to do that is to ask from the door, hey, do you, coach, do you have any Kleenex or something like that? And then I could tell you. So then he proceeds to blow his nose and one, this is pet peeve, throws it in my own trash as opposed to the weight room trash. And I was like, like I didn't tell him this, but I'm like, dude, I'm breathing the air in here. I don't really like, why don't, ugh. anyway, so that was one thing. And then <laughs> proceeds to just go to the warm up and like start it. And I was like, no, no, no. Go to the bathroom, wash your hands. That's one of the things that even before COVID you should have done anyway, but yes. now especially <laughs> you need to like, uh. so, so then another thing you talk about how gross we are and stuff was like, we really like the way you drink a water bottle during your workout, you know, you like, you really need to be thinking about how you touch the, where your mouth is going. Yeah. Cause you're touching all of these things that even if you clean them in between, they're still pretty dirty, you know? Yeah your hands are touching the floor and they're touching all these things and like make sure that whatever you touch ideally doesn't go into your mouth. You know, <laughs> let's try not to be a child here. So, I don't know. Yeah, man, I saw, I saw a video. Yeah, we, uh, we actually bought a disinfectant and apparently so it, um, it doesn't have to get wiped down, but it has to take like 10 minutes to dry, to disinfect. And so, what we've been doing is just instead of, you know, how normally college setting, uh, it's like our blocks so, of, you know, we got a six o'clock group, seven o'clock group, eight o'clock group. We've been keeping that same model, but they only have 45 minutes in the weight room. And then we take, you know, as much time as we can to, to clean real quick. We try and hit the wherever we're going to warm up first, and then we'll hit the racks after. So then, you know, it's been 10 minutes basically by the time that they go into whatever equipment they're using, it's, it's kind of clean and dried already. Um, but it it's definitely been a hassle, so it's it's nuts. But I'm kind of lucky that we only have eight racks, you know, and not a ton of equipment. So that way, it, it it takes pretty close to 15 minutes, but at least we can get it done. So I feel even though that's that's a hassle, that I hope something like this, not just in the strength conditioning setting, continues, but just almost everywhere. Mm -hmm. Just for example, like mm -hmm. all the grocery stores around here, they have somebody out front, you know, disinfecting the carts and everything, yeah. wipe them down. Let's continue that forever. Yeah. Like, you know, that, especially like the flu season, like every, anytime. The grocery carts are disgusting. They're dirty, you know? Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. Let's clean them. Let's keep things cleaner. Yeah. To some extent. Now, I mean, obviously, you know, the extent we're doing now may be a lot, but, uh, you know, I, I had to beg kids to wipe down their benches and stuff when they were done with them. It's mm -hmm. like, do you just sweat all over that bench? I'm not laying on that bench. I don't want another athlete to lay on that bench. Just give it a little wipe down. Just let's, let's clean it up a little bit. Right. Yeah. You don't have to spray the whole rack, but let's just get the bench. Okay. <laughs> That's half well, the reason I don't yeah, use yeah. benches, man. Just, just yeah. say like, <laughs> you know, you, you, you guys are gross, man. Like, yeah. but. Oh. So, you know, you think about like, yeah, so we're trying to prevent COVID, but then you're right. There's, there's the flu, there's MRSA, you know, like there's so many different things that you're like, oh crap, like my weight room is <laughs> hopefully safe, but like there's so many things that people could get, you know? So, I'm not you know, saying it's, it's a, people. I'm not saying it's a Petri dish, but we're trying to prevent it from be becoming a Petri dish. dish. You know? Right. You know, and that. And, and, and that's where it's like the athletes are like, oh, whatever. I'm like, okay, hold on. But you didn't see, you think you're the only one who works out on that bench. You didn't see the other people who sweat as much as you did before you did, you know, like, uh, I'll be right back. or, you know, uh, okay. So I actually saw one time they, they were tracing like a, a case of MRSA or staff, you know, like a mm -hmm. bunch of people were getting it like on top of their calves, almost like by their knee. And they're like, okay. like, what is that? And they tried to figure out where it was. And it was uh, on a sitting hamstring curl. Mm, Somebody wasn't okay. cleaning like, where your knee bends. Yeah. And it was, you know, just something simple like that, that they, they thought that they were getting where you're sitting. But like, 
unless you're wearing really short shorts, I mean, that's not a whole lot of skin contact. But, you know, whether your your knee touches where it's it's contracting, then it is. Yeah, but, yeah my boss, uh, at when I was at William Mary, uh, he uh, he had numerous cases before I even got there. You know, it was an issue. Um, and one of his rules was, you know, no sleeveless shirts in the weight room. For anybody, no team was allowed to have everybody had to wear a sleeve shirt. Though. So even when you're laying on a bench, you're not having that skin contact near mm-hmm. your shoulder. But, uh, you know, somehow we still had somebody get some MRSA on their upper arm. And it, it, was, it was a disaster. Right. It's a disaster. But yeah. that's one of the things I adopt. I, I even don't like to wear sleeveless shirts when I'm using other people's equipment. You know, if I'm right. doing body weight exercises at home or something yeah sure i'll i'm in my own home but if i was at a gym or anything i want to wear a sleeve shirt even if it's just the arm pump you know right yeah but most people want to get the sleeveless shirt so the guns off i get it <laughs> you know they'll right. still grow with sleeves they'll still grow You're right absolutely <laughs> and you know i think when you get used to wearing sleeves watching people who don't wear sleeves like for some reason like it doesn't seem that classy like i get it right like it's cool to see your arms but for some reason in my head like you're cooler if you can see a pump through your sleeves than if you have to not wear sleeves yeah i mean like same if you're with wearing sweatpants yeah you know like if you can see how big your legs are wearing sweatpants you know then you got big legs yeah if you're filling out your shirt you're doing good right If, if your shirt has a lot of room you don't need to take it off while you're working out. <laughs> you, you got some ways to go. You're okay. We, t- we talking about the skinny guys who think they're huge? Well, we started talking about skin contact in the weight room, you know, MRSA cleaning and things like that. And then we got to talking about arm pumps and skinny people. And Yeah. We got so, off topic a sorry. little bit. <laughs> Talking about uh, filling out stuff. So my mom bought me these extra large sweatpants for Christmas one year. And I'm pretty sure they're like skinny jean sweatpants. Joggers. Because, but, no, they go all the way down to my ankle. The problem is my calves are a decent size. And they fit my, my legs, which also I feel like are a decent size. But they're very tight on my calves. And I don't know if I can wear them in public without people being like, oh, you're trying to show off your calves? I'm like, not really. I'm just wearing these sweatpants my mom bought me, but whatever, I guess. Calves are the biceps of the legs now? Right? No, oh, they always have been. <laughs> That's why I wear sweats so much, man, so I can cover them up, you know? <laughs> but Hey, man, when you're at the beach, you know, the, your legs, you, you see the calves. What was that? What was that thing? Kind of plus, nice calves. What was that thing that uh, was it? White? Like, was it Jim White that said something like, "What's more important, like uh, forearms or calves on the strength coach?" And it was like, uh, "The forearms are more important because you can cover up the calves." Is <laughs> something like that? I don't I've ever heard that, but I, I don't. I can't either. remember if it's Jim or not, but I don't know. It came through in the weight room at some point, so probably a good debate there. You know, I went into a a store once time and this dude was like, man, how do you get big calves? And I was like, I mean, I think I've just been born with them. Yeah. Like pretty sure when I was five, my dad would be like, hey, neighbor guy, come over and look at my kid's calves. (laughs) That probably is. Like, (laughs) oh, there's a good football player. Little did I know that those big calves mean, hey, he's going to be strong and slow. (laughs) Yeah, man, because you you look at. You look at like any NBA guy or any basketball player. When have you ever seen those guys with like a jacked set of calves? I, well, I, I would mean, say they're more if it ripped. Is, it's a, a lot of tendon and then a calf. Yeah, right. But they don't have just, size. They don't have ball. No, right, right. It's just it's, like straight up. Mm-hmm. You know, but like, is there high jumpers? Same thing. Right. You know, so like, is there a predictor of? Is there a predictor of what this person's going to be good at without, without really testing them? Is there anything you can tell by just looking at them? You know. Mm. But I don't know. What do you 
What do you do this for is just a guess? I would say if you have like really big calves, really big lower legs, I'm guessing maybe shot put or discus. You'd probably be pretty good at. What? You want to go to shot put or discus? <laughs> if you practice it, uh, <laughs> you got to practice it and right. train for it, of course. But I mean, I would love to get into the Highland games. I know that's not the Ooh. same. Oh, you would, like, you would be good. Cool. I can see that. I can see you doing that. Because you're the. Uh, so, Bradley, uh, Flood, you cheered in college, right? Yep. So you're good at throwing, you know, yeah. throwing people yeah. into the air. So, I mean, yeah. you're not, not too yep. far off, right? Well, I mean, throwing people, I'm doing backflips, stuff like that. Like, I think three weeks ago, I checked, I still can do a backflip. So that's cool. Wow. So what, how do you check that? Like, what happens if you fail? Like, you just <laughs> like break your skull a little bit, or what? How do you fail on? So that exactly? here, here's how it works. When I'm out of shape, I don't check. When I get back <laughs> into shape, I feel like okay. So I'm I'm lean enough. I'm strong enough. Like I know that I can do this. It might be kind of ugly, but like I can land. Yeah. That's when I go. Okay. <laughs> if I'm like super out of shape, it's not worth trying. Like if you're 30 pounds overweight, you're like, nah, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna give yeah, that a go. No, 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 no. no. So, but yeah, uh, you know the other thing is like, I, I mean, you might be able to get calves to grow by doing you know calf isolated exercises, but just like, yeah, heavy stuff, heavy Olympic lifting. I feel like those things also help your your calves grow too. So, I guess Olympic lifting in general doesn't have to be heavy, but. I was gonna say I think I learned this from uh, Roberson back at Ball State, but he's like, "Hey, if you want big calves, do squats." Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, because the calf mm -hmm. still crosses the knee joint. Yeah. Now, I mean, your soleus may not benefit a whole lot from it, but uh, yeah, I mean, bend, bend your knee, you're gonna work your calf. So, right, man. There's there's so much I learned from Roberson in such a short time, and uh, you know, like he he really did do an excellent job of summing everything up. And absolutely. just tell, telling you what you absolutely needed to know. And like, I remember he told me, let's see, I probably was like a, I don't know, junior. And he's like, look, all that really needs to happen for performance is you either need to lift something maximally while having the intent to move it as fast as you can or move a submaximal object while still having the intent to move it as fast as you can. He's like, that's about it. Like there's some other stuff in there, but, if that makes up the bulk of your program, you're probably going to be headed in the right direction. And for some reason, everybody likes to overcomplicate everything. I don't get it. Yeah, I, I agree. You know, one of the things that I really appreciated from him was the way he programmed his uh, pull-ups and chin-ups. Mm -hmm. How he would just give like a number. Just give 32, 31, 25, whatever it is. because a lot of people want to say, let's do three sets of 10. Cool. Have you seen the last four reps of each set? They're God awful. Yep. They're half reps. They're not even good reps. Mm -hmm. They shouldn't even be counted. Mm -hmm. Just do as many as you can. Perfect reps. Then stop. Rest and then go and do more. And it may only be, you may get eight the first time, then six, five, two, one, 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 but they're quality reps, which yep. is exactly what you want. You don't, you don't want crap. Mm. And I, I still do that all the time. Yeah, I still keep that all in the there. Time. Like with the guys that I'm working with, I'll put in – like these guys can go for a while, you know, and they they can knock out a lot of body weight stuff. But you start adding – like I look at training as a continuum. Like on this side, we've got like the absolute speed. On this side, we've got absolute strength. And these guys, they've got, you know, a different continuum where it's absolute endurance, absolute strength, you know. And they've got the endurance down. But – like I've started programming in some weighted chins and I'll tell them, look, it's either one set of 30, 30 sets of one. I don't care. Just get them all knocked out. And exactly to your point, Bradley, you know? So. Yeah. I mean, your clientele there is going to be, you know, their pull-ups and chin-ups should probably be amazing. And there's, there's some guys like they can hit their body weight, but you add some weight to them and it's, it just goes right down. So it's a different stimulus they're not used to. Yeah. And I look at it from an, from an economy standpoint too, is man, if, if you want to, you know, it's like, it's like running, for example, 
if you want to be more economical per stride, it would be in your best interest to be stronger because you're going to put less energy into each stride to maintain the same speed. You know, so if you get stronger, you can work easier at that pace. So to them, it makes sense. But I mean, it's just something nobody's ever told them before. So, yeah. A little but, off topic. Have they ever had a coach? Yeah. Um, they've had, area? Yeah. They've had a few guys uh, come through um, that have, have moved on and whatnot. Um, but, you know, just, just different, um, different format, different coaching style. Um, I see myself more as a, more as a teacher. You know, I'm not, I'm not the raw, raw scream and yell kind of guy. I'm more of, you, neither. you know, I'm going to go up and communicate with the guys and just say, Hey, look, here's what's going on. Here's what you need to do. And granted, like if, if we're going for like a rep max or like they need some, a little bump, like that's one thing, but you know, I'm not going to scream and yell every single time because they're going to become desensitized to that. They're just going to be like, yeah, yeah. He's some guy just yelling again. Um, well, so it's a little bit they're already desensitized to that. And you actually probably are getting more because of the Good fact point. that they used to yeah. yell at all the time. Yeah, I, I think Good so. Point. I think that's a great point, man, because he, uh, um, I've heard, I've been in the room when some of these guys are getting chewed out for various things. And man, I'm just like, all right, I'm going to go over here and let you two work that out. <laughs> you know, I'm sure you don't need me here for this. So I think uh, it's more of just, it's probably refreshing, you know, to know like well, they, have, they have a question and I'm not going to yell at them or scream at them for it or whatever. You know what else though is like, I mean, so similar to, I mean, for sure your clientele, but like Mike, so I'm taking 18 to 22 year olds and ideally they know how to work out the rest of their life. Mm -hmm. They may take a few years off after college, right? And like, oh man, I can't ever do a 6 a.m. But, but like your dudes, Travis, are going on and eventually going to be leader ideally. Mm -hmm. And if they know how to do things correctly, one, they can take care of themselves, mm -hmm. right? So they, they'll know how to lift when they get to their unit and they'll yeah. know how to do those things when not telling them what they have to do. Mm -hmm. But then two, when they get the option, ideally they're doing it right for the people that they lead. Yep. So you know, I think that teaching approach is, is hopefully going to work uh, for a really long-term gain. Yeah. I'm, I've always been more of a principle based guy and you know, like I just think it's stupid when people get on and argue methods and methodology of, how to train it's like oh my god can't we just agree on like five to ten principles and if you're intelligent the methods can be applied many you know um i don't know that's just kind of how i see it but they almost even depending on the time of year my methods may change yeah exactly you know exactly. are we in season are we out of season are we is it uh you know is it a max strength day? Are we just doing a recovery day? Is it, uh, are we testing? Are we, uh, you know, just on some movement work? Every day can be a different method. Yeah. Well, just and know, the, it depends on the team. Is, right. Right. So, I mean, like you talk about some teams that just take training a little more seriously. Like by the time that you've had them for a few years, you could probably play around with some really complex things. If you thought that they're training, age was old enough and they could handle that whereas some teams who you know they only train once or tw you know let's say twice a week the whole four years you're ever going to get them and they they take it you know they get their work done but that's about it uh yeah, you can only do the basic stuff you know so give me one second here yeah depending on my uh whichever when i was at wayne mary whichever team i was working with may be different mm -hmm. You know, there's the type of kid that they have. You know, if I was training my, uh, you know, women's gymnastics team, yep. You know, I'm probably not gonna scream and yell at them. That's not what they want or need. Mm -hmm. They were pretty self motivated. They did a great job in the weight room. You know, I have to try to encourage some people from now and then. Which heck, I want that too. Sometimes, you know, everybody does. Right. But they're gonna be a lot different than our baseball team. Yeah. Who you know wouldn't mind you know, getting in their face and yelling at them a little bit more. You know, it's just each, each hour of the day may be different. Every, uh, yeah. man, it is. <laughs> the reason I was laughing, man, is because like every time I've worked with a baseball team, it's been like a nightmare. 
But <laughs> when when I'm work, because there's just something about the that group, that personality style, getting together and just like, oh my god, guys, can we can we focus for like just 45 minutes, maybe? But when you work with the when you work with them individually, totally different ball game, you know? Yeah, I. I mean, again, I've only worked with you know about six different teams, but you know, from when I first started. I mean, the, the team got after it. They mm-hmm. loved the weight room. They lifted hard, heavy, everybody, position guys, pitchers. But then, you know, a couple of years later, different team, mm-hmm. you know, it was hard to coach them because the skill, I don't want to say skill, that's the wrong word, the position players still love to lift, but some of the pitchers were iffy about it. They didn't really want to. Yeah. So trying to coach them at the same time, you had to split them up because they were just, they were two different groups, right? Two different needs and their needs are different. We, we didn't program all the players the same because pitchers are different than the position guys, mm-hmm. but we usually have them in the weight room at the same time. But then you almost had to get to a point where it's like, all right, let's split them up. One coach, take one, one coach, take the other. And so they're not even near each other mm-hmm. because it just, it was, a uh, the energy was a lot different. The latter years, they're still a great team. But right. just in the weight room, the chemistry that they had was just different. Yeah. It's just different. Yeah, because you take you take like a wrestler or a hockey player or a lacrosse guy. I mean, they're just different. It, it's like each sport does have a different personality type. So it makes you wonder like, all right, does this sport attract this personality type? Because like a wrestler is going to want you just to – beat the crap out of them physically and they're just going to want to be smoked to think that a workout has been effective, you know, and you have to educate them say like, look, it doesn't, it doesn't take yep. an absolute, you know, just getting the crap kicked out of you to, to be an effective stimulus. Fatigue and soreness is not a sign of a good workout, right? right. It's a sign of a hard workout, maybe but not yep. a, not necessarily a good one. Yeah. When I was volunteering at Ohio state, I mean, they had every sport under the sun there. The wrestlers, you could throw whatever you wanted at them, and they just ate it up. They, they, those, those guys were – those guys uh, and lacrosse goalies and soccer – or uh, and hockey goalies, man, those are a different breed of individuals. Yep. They were – they they were they were crazy. I mean, Fun to work with. They worked like, hard. Oh, sure. But they're just different breeds. Someone else to say, hey, hey you know – that I'm defending this tiny box. I know it's going to hit me. That's fine. <laughs> oh, the lacrosse goalies, when they come in, I mean, women, men, doesn't matter. They'd come into the weight room, bruises all over the body. I'm like, oh, my God. Oh, my God. Mm-hmm. And they come in, they, they do their job, man. They come in and lift, and <laughs> they got to be sore as crap, but they, they're still doing their job. Mm-hmm. They're fun to work with. Flood was your favorite group to work with, man. Oh, let me think. I mean, here at Cameron or like in general? Put them on the spot here. Yeah, let's say, uh, let's say, what about Cameron and then what about Lax? Um, here, I would, I'd have to say softball because consistently they, they come in, they work hard. I don't mm-hmm. have to tell them much. Uh, uh, they focus on doing things correctly, you know, and, and, basically top down for the most part with, with everybody, uh, you know, and it, you always got to take freshmen and kind of like create, you know, get them into the culture and stuff like that. But like for years, I've, I've always had really good experiences with them. Uh, I would say female athletes in general, from my experience, mm-hmm. have always listened significantly better than male athletes. hundred, hundred percent. They'll, they'll come Absolutely. in and they're like, Dudes, will, they'll they'll bust it, you know. Like they'll they'll work really hard, but like they think they know everything, mm-hmm. even if like they started yesterday. <laughs> Whereas for the most part, um, the females that I work with are like, "Hey, you tell me what I need to do," and they'll listen and they'll apply it. Uh, but some of them, you have to say, "Hey, you know, I think you can handle more weight," you know, or like yep. you can yep. do this, and, and they'll they'll they just don't. I think they just don't know what they can do until they learn. Once they they learn, though. Then they're fantastic, but again, they always I think have <laughs> feel like they want to be coached. Whereas, like I said, a lot of male athletes don't necessarily have that same. They want to be good, but they 
aren't always willing to listen to the coaching that will get them there. 100% agree. Mm-hmm. I think the women athletes underestimate themselves. Yeah. And male athletes overestimate. Yeah. You know, and you know, male athletes, they want to, you know, we'll put up, you know, let's do a, you know, two warm up sets and we're going to go a little heavier, three sets of five, follow these weights on your sheet. And then on the last set, they go 20 pounds over their weight. And then they only get three reps instead of the five we're supposed to hit. It's like, yeah. well, you're not following the direction. Or they're, or they're really ugly reps. You're like, yeah. Come on, man. It's, it's not good. While the, on the, on the women's side, they'll follow the reps, but then they'll be like, oh, that was pretty easy. I'm like, yeah, you're stronger than you think. Yep. Mm-hmm. So it's like you can push yourself. Last night, Claire, my oldest daughter, who's five, she was sitting on the couch with me and we were watching on YouTube. It's a five minute video of nothing but deadlift pass outs. All right. <laughs> so it's just a cut up. <laughs> it's just a cut up of these guys. It's all 100% on the five minutes of video. It's all males, not one oh, yeah. female, not one female. And the guys, this five minutes, man, garbage technique, too much weight, straining for too long. And Claire looked at me and she's like, are there any girls on here? And I'm like, uh, not on this video. Because no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I agree. I mean, I mean, I, I thought it was a lot easier to work with women athletes they do they do listen they do follow directions but they do that i think they underestimate their ability they can handle yeah. a lot more than what they think they're a lot stronger than they think they are and uh once they find that ability and it may take them a couple years mm-hmm. man they're, they're, they're freaking awesome yeah because <clears> i think i think a, i think there's a lot of things going on but you know, number one is the the myth of like they're afraid of getting quote big and bulky, like we've all heard or whatever. The other thing that's going on is like society. They probably feel some societal pressure or uh, uh, um, for, like pressure from their friends, like oh, what if I lift too much or whatever. Like there was a there was a girl I was working with a few years ago. She was a sophomore in high school, and like I would coach her just like I would coach any other guy. And I would get after her just as much. Man, her squat got up to 255 for a back squat. And she was mainly doing Olympic style lifting. So then she looked at that and she's like, oh my God, I didn't think I could do that. Yeah, exactly. You're just as strong. You just need to, it starts up here, you know? Um, but anyway, man. I say, I think society pressures a huge influence mm-hmm. on you know, women athletes, especially if they have a lot of friends who aren't in the athletic setting. Right. Cause their friends don't understand, mm-hmm. you know, what their, their daily schedules like their daily. I mean, it's a grind. College athletics is a grind and they, and then obviously, I mean, you have celebrities and you have all the, you know, TV and movies too, but it, it, I think it plays a, a very large role you know, and how they see athletics and how they see weightlifting. Yep. You know, what's really interesting is, uh, so I was an academic advisor in between my stints as a strength and conditioning coach. And so some of the stuff that I was learning in my master's degree was uh, about identity. And, you know, there, there's this really strong athletic identity. And the problem sometimes is like when your athletic career ends, like that's it because you haven't developed anything else, you know, mm-hmm. like in college, you haven't decided, okay, so yeah, I'm an athlete now, but like eventually I want to start a business or do whatever else. Or like, yeah, I'm an athlete, but I can also play an instrument or whatever else. Right. With athletics being such a grind is that you tend to only work at, or uh, tend to only hang out with your team more and more because they have the same schedule. And so like, you know, you just understand, hey, they're the, they're the same ones who understand we get up at 6 a.m., you know, mm-hmm. with traveling this weekend and all this other stuff. The positive, though, to that is at least they understand the lifting. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And at least at least you got some friends, hopefully, who are like, oh, no, I, I get that, you know, we're in the weight room and we're lifting weights and stuff like that. Uh, but normally it, it's a problem because it's like, man, I, I really wish there's nothing wrong with being uh, friends with who your teammates with. 
but it'd be nice for you to have some friends off the team as well. Mm -hmm. You know, and that, that doesn't always happen. So. Yeah. I was going to say, I mean, most of the teams I've worked with, I would agree with you that, you know, some of their best friends are their teammates because they're spending so much time together, but every now and again, you'll have, I don't want to use that the word like outcast, but it's just someone who's almost doesn't quite fit in with the team, mm -hmm. but they have a lot of other friends outside of the team. And for whatever reason, I mean, they just, they, the chemistry may not be there for them, yep. which is sad because why can't you be both, man? Have some great friends on the team and have some great friends off the team. That's fine. I don't care. You know, as long as they're positive influences on your life, you know, right. and everybody understands right. You know, I have to get up at 6 a.m. for a lift, you know, three days a week. And I can't hang out with you tonight, but let's do something this night or let's grab lunch, whatever. I don't, you know, as long as just make it work. That's fine. Yeah. yeah. Man, I remember, uh, you guys remember that article that came out a few years ago about Michael Phelps and his, uh, his depression and all that stuff. Um, talking about identity, you know, because he didn't know anything outside of the pool. And he didn't, from what I, from what I read in that article, man, I mean, he didn't really, do anything else. I mean, that was his entire focus, but, um, you know, it shows that to some degree, I don't know. It's weird. Cause it's like, if you want to be mega, mega successful, you probably do have to be a little unbalanced to some degree, but not to the point where it's going to drive you to depression and things like that, you know? Um, but yeah, it's, that's an interesting topic for sure. The yeah. William and Mary was an interesting school. Um, I mean, they had a lot of great teams and everything, but when you think of, you know, athletic powerhouses, mm -hmm. you know, William and Mary isn't usually one of them. Mm -hmm. That's not an insult to William and Mary at all, but they're a phenomenal academic school mm -hmm. and they are, you know, those kids, except for maybe two or three of them who may get actually drafted into some sport, you know, they are student athletes, like students academics is number one all has been and conti will continue to be mm -hmm. and a lot of those kids you know they do a lot of internships you know over the summer you know which from a strength and conditioning standpoint i always didn't like because they were you know too busy doing internships and some of their training went to the wayside but uh when they graduated you know they already had you know internships they probably already had jobs lined up you know they kind of knew who they were and where they wanted to go you know so they had a lot of success post-college but if you were you know working with some you know power five you know schools you know the football basketball teams you know they may be a lot different mm -hmm. than where they have so. to be there all summer long they don't have the opportunity to do those internships or even travel abroad or anything like that you know, it's a lot different. Yeah. So a couple of things really interesting to get uh, the perspective of some of the athletes of where I went to get my master's. So they kind of said, you know, one, like you said, very time limited on, on certain things, but two, some of them said, you know, I came in and I was going to be an architecture major or I was going to be this major. And I got told that interferes with practice. Mm. You wow. got to switch your, so you telling me, you're going to pay for my school, but I can't get the degree I want, you know, like mm -hmm. so what's even the point of giving me a, a degree and right. yeah, it's going to help get a job in something you don't want to do, you know? Um, so one of the benefits, I, I love that about William and Mary, but one of the other benefits that, that here at Cameron and, and I think in division two in general with the whole life in the balance um, mm -hmm. is that most people aren't going to get drafted. Most people aren't going pro. Not everybody knows that, you know, there's a lot of people who come in like, Hey, so what's your career goal, man, to play ball. Cool. <laughs> what's your scary plan or what's your, your, your parallel plan What's the other option. So usually how I try and like to phrase that is like, okay, so whenever that ends, what's, what's the next step, mm -hmm. you know, or like, what else are you doing? But then if it's like, well, if it ends in the four years you're in college or if it ends in 15 years, you know, but, but what are you going to do after? Um, uh, and, and I know that's not always our job as strength coaches, but I do think that holistic development is, and I don't think it's bad to talk to them about career goals and mentoring them and stuff and, you know, hard work outside of just the weight room, you know, is, is good, you know, whether it's in the classroom or practice or in life, like grit, 
you know, like, yeah. okay, so COVID happens, you're just going to give up or we're going to find a way to get through it and, you know, figure out how to keep going with life. So I kind of yeah. think about it as, you know, if I'm a strength coach and, you know, my daughter's on the soccer team, what would I want that atmosphere to be like? You know, and where she may not go pro. Let's say she's not going to. What type of coach, like, do I want working with my kid? And that's exactly who I want. Like, understand, like, you need to work hard in the weight room. You need to work hard on your field. You know, work hard for your teammates, your coach, for yourself. But make sure your coaches also realize that, like, your future is not in this. Mm -hmm. Let's make sure we set them up for success off the field. Yeah. And I think you can accomplish that in the weight room too, you know, just teaching discipline and, you know, accountability, you know, and I, I, we, you know, at William Mary, I mean, there's schedules, they run a big school. So, I mean, certain classes were only offered at certain times. So scheduling the entire team to get in the weight room wasn't always a possibility. And I always tried to come at it as, okay, that's fine. They need to make sure they get their coursework in. They get their classes in that go to their degree. I'll try to do my best to work around that so they can still come into the weight room and get their workout in. It just may be at a different time from the rest of their team. That's just it. Student athletes. Yeah, man. I remember, uh, you know, when I was at uh, lacrosse with uh, Flood, I got, I was talking, tell me if you remember this flood. Like I, we were talking to uh, Kevin Schultz, who's the head strength coach there. And now he's at university of Wisconsin at Madison um, as their head Olympic guy. But uh, anyway, we we're talking to Kevin one day and he was telling us about his experience at uh, Carnegie Mellon. And he said, Carnegie was the same way about, you know, athletes coming in and they're like, look, man, I'm just here to lift and go to practice. And then I got a lot of studying to do. And basically all the kids who are at Carnegie are are there for academic reasons and purposes. So at least the way Kevin told it was like, it didn't, it's not as competitive as some of the other places, you know, because the academics truly do come first, but uh, you know, which, which really doesn't sound that bad, you know, because it's all about balance and making sure that, they're surrounded by people who are, understand that balance and that holistic approach. So what I think is really, really important, and I had to find this out when I came here, is knowing what the purpose of your institution is. Hmm. If you're not a Power 5 school, you'll never be a Power 5 school. You don't have the resources to be a Power 5 school. <laughs> you know, like, right. if, if you're a, a William and Mary, be the best you can be for them. If you want to move, because that's not the type of person you are, like, cool, move. But like, if you if you like Division Three because you like kids who don't aren't aren't on scholarship, like, listen, you just have to buy into me as much as you possibly can, and then you know, cool. But like, not every school is the same, and I had to learn that at first. But I think once you get to that point, you figure out like, okay, what's the best I can do at this institution with the kids who end up coming here? Then then hopefully. Uh, you're more satisfied with your job than if you were trying to make it something different. Yeah, I think, I think that's a good point. You know, just, you don't, you financially don't have the resources to make it a power five unless there's a couple billionaires that come along and suddenly decide to turn it into that. But, uh, I mean, you know, William and Mary was, I mean, they, they got great athletes. Mm -hmm. It's just, you know, and they had, like I said, they had a lot of success, a lot of great teams. They won a lot of championships. You know, I, I would like to win more, but, you know, who, who what doesn't want that? But they also had the mindset of is I'm a, I came to William Mary to play sports, but also to get a great degree and to set myself up for success in the future. That is not necessarily my sport. See, that's where I think, you know, schools like Ball State, Central Michigan, those places are unique because they're mid-majors, you know. So we've got the D1 classification, but it's not quite a uh, power five, you know, so what happens in a, a situation like that? What kind of, what kind of culture do the sport coaches create? What kind of culture is created from the, you know, everything from the AD down, you know? Um, but anyway. Um, yeah, I mean, we had, you know, a lot of different coaches who came through William Mary. I mean, some came from D three schools, 
you know, I mean, William Mary is division one. They're just FCS, you know, they're the, again, they're not the power five schools or even the Mac and um, they're a little smaller than that. But, uh, you know, they were still D one. We still competed against a ton of, you know, Virginia techs, Dukes, North Carolina's all those ACC schools. And, you know, some of those games we were competitive in some of them we weren't, but, uh, you know, depending on the coach, the head coach, his background, where they came from D three, D one, where they an assistant at D one and then came here. And you know, I think that dictates a lot of the team's culture and where they want to go. You know, it's, every team was different. Every, every, that was one of the hardest parts for me as a college strength coach was you may want to create a culture for the weight room, but the culture for the weight room is going to be different per team because it starts yeah, with the head absolutely. coach. If, you know, if my, right. some of my expectations, the weight room are so high, but the coaches, they're like, you know what? We want them to lift. We want them to train, get stronger, but they didn't have a huge understanding of the weight room. Uh, they didn't understand all the benefits it could offer. So, you know, we go lift, but, you know, then send them up to practice. Or, so, okay. You know, well, I want them to, like, have fun. Well, so, I'm not saying we can't have fun, but, like, it's, are you asking me to tone it down? Yeah. So it's more of a cake, but they enjoy it more? Like, are, are we just trying to exercise here? Yes. Or are we trying to, like, and, you know, and truly, it's not your team. Nope. It's the head sport coach's team, right? No matter how which much is, they say it's weird. your team. or Yeah. I've yeah. had that a lot. Do you what, know, so, what you I need mean, to also, do. Do what you need to do. Okay. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Ultimately, though, I mean, it, it comes down to what they want, you know, so. Yep. Talking about relationships with uh, sport coaches? Mm-hmm. So flood, I got, I got one for you. Um, okay. when, uh, Bradley, I can't remember if you had graduated cause you're, you're ahead of me by a year or two, right? I graduated ball state in 11. Okay. I graduated in 10, uh, with undergrad. So I think, yeah, mine was masters. Yeah. Yeah. You were finishing your master's stuff. So I think you will probably remember this story, but so flood basically like, uh, robe had men's basketball and i can't remember what other, what other teams but anyway like he would test uh he would test a couple things but one of them was uh deadlifting and i think i think it was deadlifting and bench pressing if i remember right and uh anyway his te- he was testing uh deadlifting and this kid came in as a freshman and pulled like 405 and uh anyway sport coach basketball coach came in had everybody lined up and he he's like he called over to rope. He's like, Hey, come with me. And they went player by player. And the basketball coach goes, all right. Uh, I want this guy to have bigger shoulders. Uh, I want this guy <laughs> to have bigger calves. Uh, I want this guy to have a bigger chest and <laughs> Robe's sitting back. He's like, what the hell, man? Like this, this dude just pulled four Oh five as a freshman. All right. Like I don't give a shit about, about his chest size. Like nobody cares about that. But that just shows like the disconnect. I think it's gotten better every year, but it does show the disconnect that still to some degree exists with sport coaches thinking like, you know, these muscles. Like I I remember talking to a swim coach one time about how he wanted his swimmers to have uh, stronger triceps so that they could, you know, finish their. I swear to God, he was saying like, so they could finish the stroke of the water and they need to have stronger triceps. I'm like not not saying that's not practical, <laughs> but you know, coaches a lot of them, not all of them, think more of like muscles. Yeah, where we tend to think more movement. Yep. Hopefully, you do. And that's just yeah. my opinion. Hopefully, you think more movement, and you know, um, chest size has. I don't give a crap what your chest size is, man. It's just no, I, I, are you strong? Sure, I let's measure that. Right. I don't care how big it is. You know, I, I think the other frustrating thing sometimes is, is sport coaches will say like, hey, I want them to be faster or, you know, s- something. And you're like, OK. And in your head, you calculate how to get there. Right. And you're like, OK, so I'm going to make them stronger and then I'm going to get their rate of force development up. You know, and you're like figuring this out. Pretty much. I mean, pretty. You're just trying to develop them as a regular athlete. right? So you're trying to make everybody 
faster and stronger and all this stuff. And so, but then they try and tell you how to do it. And you're like, that doesn't make sense. What you're telling me will not get the results you're asking for. So my favorite kind of sport coach is the one who says, listen, I don't really know a whole lot, but I just know it's important. So, and then the nice thing there is if you produce a faster, stronger athlete that is better on the field that that they can use. uh, Yeah, cool. Whatever. Yeah. I guess I feel like my ideal sport coach who who knows the importance but doesn't get in your way and is like, yeah, just do what you need to. Do what you do. I'm going to step out and let you do your thing. You know, like, uh, mm-hmm. man, I'm I'm working my way through uh, super training right now. And Oof, man, if I, yeah, if I if I hit five pages a day and <laughs> and and comprehend those five pages, <laughs> I'm happy. I'm like really happy. But mine was like three pages. Mm-hmm. I'm like, oh my god, I got to go back and reread this. But man, I was reading the other day and they were talking about, you know, different types of strength, you know, and how you're going to, so first of all, everybody comes in and they're like, I want them to be stronger. It's like, all right, cool. But like, can you be a little more specific? Can you help me out here? Because there's athletes who are really good at displaying explosive strength, but other ones might be better at absolute strength, you know, and it just goes on and on and on. And I think a lot of people, the, the nicest sport coaches, I agree, are the ones who are like, look, do whatever you need to do. You recognize this and understand it better than I do. So have at it. I don't mind having, you know, some input mm-hmm. on, you know, don't don't be too, um, you know, necessarily in-depth about it. Because I'll, I'll be honest, like when I was at William Mary, I had six or seven teams, which in my opinion is way too much. And again, depending on what level you're at, Ryan, you may have, you know, 12 teams you're dealing with, you know, (laughs) but, uh, you know, I can't see them practice all the time. Mm -hmm. I can't watch them play all the time. I'm not seeing how well they're moving on the, in their sport. So to have a coach's input is fine, but just don't tell me how to accomplish those results. Like in volleyball, if you have somebody up front, like a blocker, you know, middle blocker, then you'd be able to jump high. Then you can get up quicker. The reaction is too slow. Okay, cool. We can try to work on that. You know, or, you know, a baseball player is just, their swing is not quick enough. We want to be able to swing faster. Okay, we can work on that stuff. I may not be able to see that stuff on a daily basis, but they can. So that type of input's fine. Just let me do what I need to do to help that athlete improve right right like if i think the the best way you could achieve that would be going to a practice and having the sport coach point out what characteristics on the court or field they need improvement in now if it's a skill thing obviously that's their job right like this kid can't hit a ball well sorry (laughs) that's your job coach Uh, Recruit, like, recruit yeah. somebody you can. So, <laughs> yeah, right. So you know, I need to, I need to better at, at this. You know, uh, this attribute, right? Like, okay, let me, like you said, let me go back then and create the plan that's going to get them there. Because I, I understand the progression. I'm going to see them, and I'm not going to just say, oh, well, you know, you know how uh, I, I feel like baseball coaches are notorious for this. Maybe other coaches too, but like not actually. Luckily, not our baseball coach. Um, Hey, so you see this major leaguers exercise? Mm. Why don't we do that? You know, well, that that seems like a very specific exercise for somebody who's been training for a very long time, and it's probably a very specific reason why they're doing that. Your freshman doesn't need to be doing. I mean, nor your senior usually, but uh, you know, I, I think that's the most frustrating. But if if the coach just says, hey, these are the things that I need improvement in, that's fine. As long as, mm-hmm. you know, like you said, trust me to, to get them there. So yeah, I don't my, I don't teach curveballs. So you know, l- no. let me let me do my job. My favorite is that oh shoot, what's that what's that running back's name for the uh for the Saints? Alvin Kamara. Oh yeah, yeah. don't get don't get me started. <laughs> don't get me started, okay? Dude, he, have you seen his training videos play? No, don't get me started, yeah. <laughs> I'm a Saints fan. I'm nervous for tonight. I'm, oh. I'm, I'm a big Drew Brees fan. You know, have been since he was at Purdue. You know, I was a, I, 
was born in Lafayette. My dad went to Purdue. So I'm a big Purdue fan, but I can't stand to watch those <laughs> videos. So flood. He's who, whoever's working with it, man. He's this dude is standing on like a Bosu ball, and they're toss. He's got like vision blockers, and they're tossing yeah. different color sticks. I like, yeah, you know, and oh it's my God. it's one of those things where um, you see it and like. You see an example of a top level dude and hey, can you say hi to Ryan and Bradley? All right. You see hi. You see a top level dude who's great anyway. It's probably not gonna matter at that point what he's doing because mm-hmm. he's he's a freak. He's he's just a freak at the at the top level. And my coach- favorite was always uh you know, I worked with men's basketball at William Mary and you know, I could always tell when LeBron James posted a video of him doing something. Because all the kids came in the next day saying, "Hey, man, let's go buy a uh, ten Versa climbers. I think we need to be doing Versa climbing for conditioning five days a week." I'm like, "You can't make fifty percent of your free throws, dude. Don't don't worry. About it, okay, <laughs> let's, 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 let's pump the brakes. Okay, let's get up and down the floor three or four times before, without running out of breath. Okay, you know the other thing too is like." The, the stimulus in a sport is so specific mm-hmm. that even like agility drills can never really mimic a sport. You know, like if, if you're going off of, uh, let's say, a sound cue mm-hmm. and their sport really is, you know, like softball, right? They're watching where the ball goes. They're not listening to the, you know, somebody say, all right, run now. You know, it's like, I mean, we're, we're really only training so much stuff. Like, ultimately, I'm just trying to make a better athlete to then practice on the court or on the field. You know, like, evading a tackle and, and all of that agility stuff, like, that's, I, for the most part, I feel like that's just being coached to play football. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. not those agility or not those uh, balance things, you know, that you're doing. But maybe, that, I don't know, maybe that's wrong. No, no, I no, think I you're think agree. Right. I think, you know, our job as a strength and conditioning coach or sports performance coach or whatever you want to call us, you know, is just to build the athletes, enhance their capabilities. Mm. But that's not developing the capabilities. That's just try to enhance them. You know, the sport coach and the athlete, that's their job to actually build those capabilities, you know, and improve on those. We're just trying to give them a, a much uh, stronger foundation. Yeah. to work on mm-hmm. just trying to make better build their capacity trying really. to increase their capacity that's what i was trying to say yeah and make make better overall athletes you know like i'll add in some stuff on on just the front side on the warm-ups man where it's it's things that are highly you know going to require a lot of coordination going to be a little awkward from time to time and sometimes you'll do eyes closed sometimes eyes open sometimes single leg because if you can do those things in the warm-up and it's going to make you overall more coordinated, it's probably going to carry over to about everything else. Well, anyway. Um, but, hey, um, I don't want to keep you guys too long, man. Um, so, Bradley, um, where are you at on, on social media, man? And how? Uh, what's a good way for people to get a hold of you? Um, just, I'm on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, just at Brookhart Performance. Uh, email just brookartperformance at gmail.com or uh, brookartperformance.com if you want to check that out. Um, pretty much everywhere. Try to be, you know, provide as much content, quality content as possible. Uh, you know, I'm not, you know, trying to provide too much fluff for a lot of people, but, uh, you know, we've all seen the Alvin Kamara videos that uh, people try to replicate and it's like, <laughs> Like don't don't do those don't do those you know you're you're gonna get hurt. Let's let's start with the basics first. Most people can benefit from the basics. So, so we're not gonna see you on there doing anything like that. No, right. no, because you'll probably see another uh, picture of me in the hospital bed with a broken hip or something. And it's like kind oh, of great. I'll Blood be out of commission for a while. <laughs> Blood, what about you, man? Where are you at on uh, social media, email? Do you want people to have any of that stuff? Or are you just saying, now I'm going to go? Not, not much. My, uh, I think I had one Instagram post before Squattober started. <laughs> and then, you know, now that's been, been going. But, <laughs> I mean, if you're welcome to uh, 
see a bunch of squats over and then probably a bunch of nothing. You, you can follow. I think it's uh, it, this is how embarrassing it is. I had to look up what I'm at. I think it's R Flood 68. <laughs> <laughs> email probably a better option if you have any questions for a division two college strength coach you're welcome to email me at rflood at cameron.edu but not not as much presence as i should have uh, I, I love following stuff and watching it you know and I, and I think a lot of people put out a lot of good content um uh, i don't really produce much so all right well hopefully There's nothing wrong with that you know, a lot of great coaches don't even have a Twitter account or Facebook, whatever. Dude, I the thing is, I have I have all three accounts, and you know, I'm trying to get a, a YouTube channel rolling, you know, and uh, produce put out more content like this. Where obviously it's no not structured at all. It's just hey, let's sit back and bullshit and learn a little bit from each other, hopefully, and hopefully some other people learn some things, and you know, it'll start to grow and build from there. But. Um, yeah, man. Uh, I'd like I'd like to do this again sometime. Get get another little yeah, round, round table discussion. So, anyway, thanks yeah. for thanks yeah. for taking the time today, guys. I really appreciate it. Oh, thanks for having me, for Travis. Sure. All right, see you guys. Yeah. Have a good one. Bye. Bye. Bye.